Hello, everyone. Welcome. I uh, hope everyone's excited for a couple of days for open source at Open Source Summit. Uh, so today, we're going to talk a little bit about, about databases and about clients. So when a new feature shows up in a database, most people focus on what the new feature does and you know, how it's implemented the server. And users sort of take for granted that it's going to be implemented correctly. And it's going to be available in all of their libraries and their ecosystems. And it's going to kind of work seamlessly. But getting that client ecosystem to work correctly is very difficult and very time consuming, doubly so when we're talking about an open source ecosystem, especially one that's very decentralized. So today, we're going to tell you a story about how AWS tried to build a new open source client and the interesting architecture that we picked that makes it work, that makes it less work for us to maintain in a bunch of different uh, languages. So this is going to be a client for Valky and Redis. I'll explain a little bit more about what those are in a second. You don't need to know anything about those kind of coming in. And so um, and to introduce us, my name is Madeline Olson. I am a principal engineer at AWS. I am also a former uh, maintainer of the Redis open source project and now a maintainer of Valky. And I'm joined by Mickey Hoder, who is a, an also a principal product manager at AWS. And he will kind of uh, talk a little bit later about what, what Glide is. So uh, to get us started, just to level set with everyone, who here knows what Redis is? Great, basically everyone. And now who here knows what Valky is? Uh, and just for my own interest, who came here because they saw the announcement in the keynote for Valky? Cool. So that was, was productive. I was a little worried because they skipped over it really fast. And I was like a little worried that nobody saw it. So Alex, don't worry. I'll explain what Valky is and how it relates to Redis in more detail. So if you've never heard much about AWS, we love to talk about customer stories. So I'm going to start by talking about what customer problem led us to build our, our own client. So me and Mickey work on a service called Amazon Elasticash, which, you, as you might have guessed, is the managed caching service within AWS. Uh, we have different flavors of databases, and we, uh, of which one of them is we supported Redis open source. So we had a company that sort of came to us and said, hey, we're having trouble with um, connection disconnects, client disconnections, um, and connection storm issues. Uh, and this be was because um, they were using something called connection pooling, which is they established a bunch of connections in up, up um, in advance and then reused those throughout the lifetime of the application. Now, you might have like 100 or so uh, application pods in a microservice architecture, and each one of those might have 20 connections to the Redis cache. And when the cache goes down for any reason, like maintenance or an unexpected failover, all of those connections get reestablished very quickly which can cause what we call as a thundering herd problem or a connection storm, which kind of can bring down the cache because it's spending so much time establishing new connections, it's not able to serve existing requests. So we had a customer like this. They had this problem. And so we did what AWS does and tries to fix this. And in this specific case, we did a lot of open source work to make it better. So the first thing we did is we went to the client they were using and implemented exponential back off in the client. This made it so that the, uh, the client was able to more easily reestablish the connections and um, lessen the load so that uh, the cache was able to come back up. We also made contributions to the core engine so that it was more resistant to this type of work by prioritizing existing connections instead of um, accepting new connections. We also wrote a bunch of blog posts and helped educate users about how to basically set up these connection pools. So this is, you know, in my opinion, a really good open source success story, right? This is what we all expect from open source. So what went wrong here? Well, Redis changed their license. So Redis used to be a permissive BSD license, and earlier this year they changed to a two proprietary licenses. So now all of a sudden we were no longer able to help uh, these users by contributing to these open source projects. So as a result, me and some other members of the community, including Victor here, who is well, another member from Valky. Um, we went and started the Valky community, which is backed by the Linux Foundation, uh, pretty shortly. And we launched a new version of Valky that uh, AWS claims it will eventually support. And then also this morning, we launched a brand new version, which, yay, so exciting. Um, if, you want, if you're interested in that, I'll talk about that. Me and Victor will talk about that more in another session tomorrow. But that's not the point of this talk. 
um, the point of this talk is to kind of just focus on the fact that uh, what Valky is is a open source fork of Redis, so that we're able to keep doing this work that we were talking about. AWS is very committed to keeping open source projects lively. And so unlike the previous Redis open source project, this is a community-driven initiative. Right? It's backed by Linux Foundation. There's a bunch of spores, including Oracle, AWS, Google, uh, other folks like Ivan, Percona. There's a lot of supporters of this project. So this is great. So what's the problem now that we have Valky? It's that now we have a lot of clients to maintain. Right? So Redis clients were initially developed sort of iteratively over time. We started with a lot of really popular Ruby clients because Redis was very popular in the, uh, the Ruby community. And so that sort of built up and a lot of features got added. And these are all based on you know, what, do, what is the community interested in. So some of the other clients were, were less developed as a result. And so over time, Redis started taking over some of these uh, clients. And so when the fork happens, what Valky had to reactively sort of kind of also fork all these clients. And so now we're sort of dealing with all of these clients in all these different languages, which isn't a great situation for us to be in. And I'd like to articulate um, some of the interesting problems specifically with Valky and Redis and why it makes it kind of difficult to build a, um, a client for all of them. So, you know, in AWS fashion again, we'll, we'll start with kind of a, a, a customer story. So one thing that clients are responsible for is discovering the topology of the, the cache at, at startup. So basically, there's a bunch of different nodes, and you have to kind of figure out where they all are. So we had a customer come to us and say, hey, we're having a lot of issues with this topology discovery event. Um, and so we had to kind of go and show them how to manually work around that and do manual uh, topology refreshes. And to kind of explain this in a little bit more detail, so when you establish a connection to Valky or Redis, um, there is a primary instance, and it's responsible. You send a command to it, you get a response back. So that is the consistent um, way to get data out. There's also an eventually consistent way. There are reader replicas within Valky and Redis, so you can also read from the replica. So every time you issue a request, you can decide should it be from the primary or the replica. And there are also multiple shards in the cluster. So you have to make the decision, does the request get read to shard one or shard two? And then you also have to make the decision um, sort of at runtime because you can dynamically add more shards. So clients need to be aware of all of this and keep track of all this information so that requests get read correctly. And on top of all of that, they have to handle when disconnection events happen when nodes fail. So when a command fail, when a node fails, you want to route the requests to the new primaries. And ideally, this should all be seamless to the end users. And what we sort of saw at AWS is all these clients were doing all this work a little bit differently and inconsistently. We had another customer who was using Redis at the time as a message queue. And that lends itself well to having two different libraries kind of push the data into the system and pull the data out. And they saw inconsistent behavior between all the different clients. So, this is sort of the backdrop where we kind of were looking at this problem being like, hey, how can we make this a better experience for our, our end users? And so with that, I'll hand it off to Mickey to talk through sort of how we tried to solve this problem at AWS. Thanks, Madeline. So I'm Mickey. I'm a product manager at AWS. I'm working on Elastic Cache, MemoryDB, and also Glide. Um, so Madeline mentioned problems that uh, uh, customers are facing with um, um, Redis OSS clients or Valky OSS clients. And we have uh, a lot of experience with the, these kind of cases. And she mentioned that we already contributed to the, back to the community. We also published blogs about how to configure those uh, uh, clients. But you know, there are dozens of clients out there uh, written in various languages, you cannot be really be successful in supporting all those clients. So instead, what we decided to do is to develop our own client, okay, a new client, use our experience to provide better experience to our customers. And this is where, where Glide comes in. So what is Glide? Glide is a client, it's a Valky client, with support to Redis open source up to version 7.2. Okay? It is open source. 
It's supported by, by the community, obviously, because we started it. It's supported by us, by AWS. But we also want to announce that GCP, Google Cloud, has joined us and collaborates on developing Glide as well. Uh, so Melin mentioned problems about configuring, pro configuring clients. So configuring clients is not a simple task, OK? It's complicated. So Glide does that for you. It comes pre-configured with best practices, so customers don't have to worry about configuring those clients. Glide is a unique uh, uh, client because it supports various languages. Okay? We did it in order to uh, provide customers with a consistent experience across the languages. Okay? So how do we do that? Let's talk about the design. So to support each and every language, we have an extension, what we call a wrapper. And a wrapper, in this case, we support Python okay, and Java. We're going we're gonna to add more wrappers. Soon we're going to add Node.js. And we're going to add Go as well and additional languages. And that, but these wrappers are fairly thin, right? They're just an API layer that communicate with the core through the communication layer. The core is where all the logic is implemented. Okay? It's written in Rust. And we chose Rust because Rust is performant and is robust. Okay? And the, uh, the core itself is responsible to communicating with all with the, with the clusters, okay? Whether it is Redis OSS or Valky. So this unique architecture allows us to provide a consistent experience across languages. So no matter what language you use, you're going to get the same behavior, right? Because we see companies that have, you know, units and they all use Redis, but they do different languages. And the different clients behave differently. But now, if they use client, it's a similar behavior, right? You know what to expect. An additional thing that we're getting is it's easier for us to introduce features or to fix bugs, because we do it only once in the core, and it is populated to each and every language. Now let's see some examples for uh, features of Glide. So Madeline talked about the way the cluster is built and what the cl a cluster topology is, right? So each, each cluster has nodes. These nodes are organized. Like we have replicas, we have primaries. And the topology keeps changing all the time. Why is it changing? Scaling in, scaling out, when you add nodes or remove nodes to the cluster, right? Failover, which means sometimes primary nodes fail, and then you do the replication. So it's dynamic. This is a hard situation for clients because they need to track all those topology changes, right? They need to keep up with those topology changes in order to avoid disconnects. So Glide is not reactive, is not waiting for failures to happen. It proactively asks for the topology view, okay, and adapts. The advantage is a more stable and reliable situation, right? Each and every node in the cluster knows what the topology of the cluster is. Even if we have 500 nodes, all of them know what the topology view of the cluster is. The problem is, that they're not all aligned. They're not always in sync for various reasons. So Glide doesn't satisfy with querying a single node and asking, hey, what's the new topology change? No. It asks several nodes in order to get the majority and then increase the confidence of getting the right topology view. Okay. Let's talk about some connection management that, that Glide does for customers. So some open source clients, they wait for the request to fail due to a disconnect before they attempt to reconnect. This reactive mode obviously increases the latency or the response time. So Glide is proactive here as well. It doesn't wait, it doesn't wait for disconnects to happen, right? Or it doesn't wait for failures. 
behind the scenes, he always queries and the connection to see that everything is okay. And if something happens, it automatically reconnects. So what you're getting at the end of the day is a better and stable result, right? And, less this, and, the, and the customer suffers less disconnects. So Glide also manages connections for you. You don't have to worry about managing connection pools, right? Or anything like that. What we do is we use a reduced number of connections. Each connection is a single connection to a node, right? And all the requests coming in are ch channeled to that specific uh, uh, connection, okay? And this is done by what we call multiplexing, multiplexing all the requests. This allows us to reduce the number of connection, have a simplified way of work, and then keeping maintaining the performance at a high level, okay? When disconnects are happening, and this is the last thing I wanna talk about here, um, Glide doesn't connect at the same time, right? All the clients, they distribute the reconnection across the time in order to avoid what Madeline shared as the connection storm. Imagine the failures are happening, all the clients try to reconnect at the same time, that's a really a load on the server, right, on the cluster. All that to say that Glide improves the reliability and stability as well as the performance. Now, let's not just talk, and I want to show it to you in a few examples. Right? You see everything? Yeah. Cool. This is a very simple example. What we're looking at is a very simple application that uses PubSub. We use a specific client. I will not mention its name, but it's not Glide. All right? And this application, what it does, it uses the uh, Redis and Valky capability of uh, a feature of PubSub. You can think about PubSub as if you want to implement a chat and you have publishers and subscribers and you have channels, right? This is usually implemented using PubSub. So it's not a simple implementation. What we're gonna see now, um, and, and I will say that the, the biggest challenge for clients in PubSub is finding out where a disconnect happened, reconnecting, and resubscribing to the channels, okay? That's a problem, that's not an easy task. Let's see how this client is handling that. What you see on the screen now is the topology view, right? We talked about what topology view is, and this specific cluster has three shards, okay? Each shard has a primary and two replicas, right? This is often called three by three. It's a popular setup, right? You have redundancy, you have performance. On the left side, what you see is a publisher that is publishing messages every second to two channels, channel number one and channel number two. I know the colors over there, these screens are not so good, but you see the colors here, I think. We just saw it before. But I'll say just channel one and channel two for the sake of the discussion. You can see that it publishes a message each, each second, okay? In the middle, there's a subscriber, and the subscriber keeps on pulling the messages out, right? He listens to the both channels, pulling out the messages, okay? That's a simple one. Everything is working, everything is fine. At the bottom, what you see is that the channels are mapped to a specific node. That's the way it works, right? For example, channel, channel number one is mapped to Valky 14506. So 14506 is shard number two, okay? That's the primary of shard number two. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna fail, or we're gonna kill this node, specifically this primary node, and we're gonna see what's going to happen. So I'll tell you what's going to happen. You will see that the cluster is attempting a, a replication failover, right? So replication is going to, to replace the primary. So what happened now is a topology change, right? This is a situation, things change in the cluster. What the client, need to, the client needs to do is to adapt to the change and reestablish the connections, okay? So what I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna kill uh, node 14506.
on the right side, you will be able to see a nice thing, right? You will see that the, the a node failure, it's out of the cluster, and a replica replaces. It takes a few seconds, and then we're going to see the cluster recovers. Take a look at the left side. You will be able to see that the publisher and subscriber are stuck, right? Nothing is going on. Do you see that? And then we see now that one channel has recovered. You see that the primary node has failed, and now it was replaced by replica, stayed at the same slot here. And now channel one is mapped to 42700, and that's fine. So you only have two, two nodes in the shard? Too. Two nodes in the shard? Yeah. yeah. You're left with two nodes. Yeah. You haven't replaced that node yet. Exactly. Okay. So what do you notice? You notice that the publisher and managed to resubscribe, and it publishes messages. What, what's, what's about the subscriber? It's stuck, right? The subscriber is stuck. This means you have a production downtime, OK? Your chat stopped working. OK? And the messages Exactly. And now what you're going to do? As a developer, you need to take your application and write some code in order to have the resubscription. Right? Now let's do, let's see how Glide handles that. So I'm switching to Glide. Exactly the same application, exactly the same setup, okay? And channel number one is mapped to uh, node number 22259. 22259. I'm going to kill the primary and we're going to see what's going to happen. So, one node is down. Take a look at the left side. You will be able to see that the channel is stopped, which makes sense. There is some downtime when you have a server downtime. Okay. Now the uh, the node is going to be replaced. The primary is going to be replaced by a replica. And what we expect to see is that Glide will resubscribe the channel as well, and everything will get back to normal. Right. So now there was some downtime because it's inevitable. However, we did recover both the client and the server. Now, the nice thing about it is this is what I want to share with you, is the code that's behind that, right? Maybe just with a bit bigger. That's the code of the application that uses pops up. Very simple. On the upper side, you see the publisher. The subscriber is at the bottom. See how easy it is. You don't have to handle errors. You don't have to manage connections. You don't have to manage the subscription. Glide does that for you. OK. Now, uh, before I move on with my deck, I just want to show you another use case, right? A scale out. We talked about topology changes. We saw failover. Let's talk about scale out. We're adding a shard to the node. This usually happens when we have more traffic, right? And we need to keep up. OK. Clicking scale out, what you will see on the, uh, on the right side, the cluster node, you'll be able to see another shard is added. OK. Then there's a new topology. The client needs to adapt to say, oh, I see a new, ch something's changed. I need to reconnect. Let's see what's going on. Tell me if you see anything wrong or do things look OK? So shard number four is added, right? Still not done. But take a look at the publisher and subscriber. They keep on working all the time, right? Now the shard four was added, OK? But you don't see a downtime. Publisher keeps uh, publishing, subscriber keeps subscribing, everything is OK. They're still on the other shark, the shark one. Which one? The could be, yeah. Could be, could. but it could be remapped, right? Okay. It's not the control of the client. Client just knows that if he wants to continue the connection or he needs to replace it. Right? So by adding shards, you give yourself more pops up capabilities. Yeah. Exactly. Shard, if it's necessary. Exactly. And we have thousands of pops up 
channels. Channels. You probably start using the new shard. Yep. Just the whole point. Exactly. Of that, the new shard. It, it could have happened, by the way. If, it, it depends on the reslotting, right? Yeah. Of the slot migration. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. Let's go back to the presentation. Yeah, we're good on time. Okay, so we've talked about uh, what Valky is, right? We've talked about uh, customer problems with clients that are existing today. We talked about what Glide is, um, how it is built, and what the advantages are. But just before we wrap up, I wanted to share our experience with, with developing this client, right? Um, so Redis and Valky both have more than 200 commands, right? We knew that, but what we didn't know is how much time it is gonna take us to implement it. And we find out that it's more difficult than we thought, right? It took us a lot more time than we anticipated. So when you develop a client, don't think it's gonna be easy, right? Second thing we wanna talk about is compatibility. We've mentioned that there are so many Redis open source clients out there, or Valky, and they all differ in the API. They're not uh, aligned, right? So when we came up with Glide and said, okay, what are we gonna be compatible with, right? So we couldn't choose any because we wanted to support several languages, remember? So it's not compatible with previous open source clients. And we figured, okay, customers will have to adopt. But we found that it's difficult because customers say, oh, we need to change the application code, even if it's minor changes, right? But it's still, we didn't, uh, we didn't think it's gonna be such a big issue, okay? And the last thing I wanna talk about is when we started developing uh, Glide, we did it on the AWS repository, on GitHub. When we launched in July this year, we moved it under the Linux Foundation and under Valky. But we, we see that it's hard to get contribution. It's not so easy from the community. But we're working on it, and I also shared that Google has joined us, and they're gonna work on the, on the, they started working on the Go client with us, or the Go extension with us. So looking forward to it. And I wanna use this opportunity and welcome all of you if you find this project interesting, join us, develop, be happy to, to welcome you. So how to get Glide? You can find it on Maven or Pip, depending on your language. As I said, we're gonna add very soon a few more languages. You can find it on GitHub, on the Valky, and we also have a Discord. If I remember correctly, this presentation is shared with you, or I think all the presentations are shared with you, so you'll be able to um, have a look and have the links. So don't worry about that. Anything else you want to say before we wrap up? I don't think so. So I hope this was interesting. I thank you for your time. You're welcome to ask questions. We're here. We're still here. We're going to be here after this session. We have an AWS booth. We're gonna be there, we're gonna run the demo again if you didn't get it or you wanna see it again. It's very easy to show it. We're gonna talk about Glide, Valky, Elasticash, Redis, whatever you wanna talk about, come and see us. Thank you for your time and I wish you a good summit. We do also have a dedicated Valky booth as well. Yes. So, it's not a us. <laughs> I would like to see this uh, in our Configuration? We don't have it in our documentation, like for, for good behavior of clients, how they should behave. Behavior or configuration or both? Oh, yeah. Can you say the question yeah, about I think, yeah. Yeah, sorry? I, what is, is, the mic, is the mic still on? Is it still on? Oh, yeah. So Victor was just asking if we should add all this to our documentation, and that's a... I, would, yeah, I think we, in that documentation, we should have an explanation how clients should behave, because we don't have that much of that. Yeah, so he's, he's saying, you know, so Victor's also a part of the technical steering committee for Valky, so he's bringing up the fact that we don't have a lot of this documentate, this, like, these best practices for clients well documented. It's sort of 
kind of hidden information. The blog post that AWS made was just on AWS. We didn't add it anywhere. There is that GitHub issue that uh, Asaf opened on the documentation page to add more information about clients and their best practices. But I still think there's a lot more work to do. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Seems like a great opportunity for contributions for anyone out there that likes to do documentation. Just saying. <laughs> I also have a bunch of questions. Yeah. I have uh, the first question is that uh, how difficult it is to add the new language to that client? Like, and what are you using to add the new language? Uh, Magic documentation. So uh, uh, we, we happen to have uh, well, one of the lead sure. developers of right here. <laughs> it's from AWS and then Bob. You can share some of your experience. Yes. Can come up here yeah, do you want to, unless, unless people want to come over a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how well, like, the question's over here. Did you hear the question? Yeah. Okay. Come over. Okay, so adding new, we call it wrappers, the extensions. Adding new wrappers, so as uh, Mickey explained, it's just a thin layer on top of the core. So there is no logic there. It's just like copy-pasting, but it's, it is in a di different language. Uh, we do need to choose the communication layer. So we have languages which we POCs it and found that using a Unix domain socket to communicate the data between the core and the wrappers is the best choice. We have languages that we are going to use direct FFI. Uh, we might switch it to shared memory later on. So there is the phase of just choosing the right uh, communication layer. And after it, that, there is a work to add APIs for like 200 or more commands. Um, but again, it's not like a very uh, deep walk. It's more like technical technical walk, adding new language, new wrapper. <laughs> and the second, the second thing just, 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 just one question to you. What language were you thinking about? Yeah. Uh, I am just generally oh, uh, okay. interested <laughs> in how, how complicated it is to create such a generic uh, client. And uh, the, second, the second question, it is basically the same question, but from the other side. It's that uh, I heard that it might be sometimes difficult to create such a, such a client. So how difficult it is to add a command to it, on the other hand? So adding commands is actually pretty simple. Mm -hmm. um, again, the logic is only one place. So mm -hmm. it depends on, the, on how complicated the, the command is. Like adding uh, get or set, getting all. Uh, setting a string uh, phrase is very simple, but as long as it gets more complicated, it has more logic, and we need like um, for, like PubSub commands, which require more logic to put in the Rust call. Um, but it again, we need to do it only one time on the core, and then APIs are just like the technical work of adding them uh, uh, on top of that. Awesome. Thank you. No problem. Does Glide support Sentinel commands? Sorry, which commands? Does Glide support Sentinel commands? No. Uh, at the moment, we don't support Sentinel commands. But if it's a request, <laughs> it can. Uh, We're open to contributions. Yeah, we are more than welcome. <laughs> On my to do list, ever growing to do list. <laughs> it's written in Rust. Uh, so I guess you have to support Rust as well. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so it, it is true. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, what about C++ and C? Is that not also select? So we actually don't have yet uh, uh, client support for the Rust. Uh, we don't have wrapper uh, in Rust. Oh. Um, yeah, so it's funny, but it's... Oh, there is a reason, right? I mean, yeah, because you can uh, actually use the, the, the client, the inner client that we are using. But we do want to add maybe later on a wrapper in Rust, but um, actually... Again, contributions and the, the requests from uh, our users. Yeah. Uh, again, for uh, same for C and C++. Um, yeah. So yeah. Wouldn't you not need a wrapper for Rust because it already is Rust? Yeah, yeah. So it's yeah, going to be. It's like going to be. add Valky Glide or no? Well, I, so I don't know if it was mentioned, but it's built on top of Redis Rust today. Yeah. Um, Redis. Redis. Um, so you could just use that client, and it's that. yeah, and it's exposed. I think as Valky in Cargo. I guess. Valky dash 
I don't remember. Yeah, sounds right. Yeah, so, so you can just use that. It's true for the cluster mode client. For the standalone, we add more logic in, mm -hmm. in Glide. Um, but so we, we would need to do some work yeah. to, to uh, publish it to Cargo. Yeah. Um, it's, not, it's, not yet on, it's not yet on crates. It's not yet on crates. Okay. The cluster client is uh, for Redis RS. Okay. Uh, but you brought up a good point that there's just inconsistency between clients. Like some, some client may use cluster nodes, some may use cluster shards, and there's slightly different information exposed in them. So. Yeah. Those that are using cluster nodes are doing it wrong, though. Yeah. <laughs> nope, they're doing it wrong. I agree. <laughs> Actually, I remember you and I were chatting two years ago about cluster shards. I mean, three years ago. Yeah. Some reason to use cluster nodes. I mean, you want to support old versions, and you don't, and you don't want to do supporting. You have a lot of fragmentation. It's, it's compact. It's more compact. No. <laughs> <laughs> but then it becomes like legacy support, right? It's two or whatever. It doesn't have cluster shards. Oh, Redis 5. Well, then you wouldn't use... <coughs> yeah, whatever. Whatever. Redis 5 does. Or Redis 6 doesn't have cluster shards. Yeah, that is a lot of... I like how we scared everyone else away besides the people who know what Falky <laughs> is already. <laughs> yes, Jonathan? Yes. Speaking of old stuff, um, from kind of a different perspective, are there plans for the Rust component to use basically tons of bits and pieces like dependencies, uh, you know, other Rust dependencies that are going to arbitrarily increase the baseline Rust version required. Um, Essentially what, what I'm saying, I'm making more of a request than asking mm -hmm. a question, is can you always make an effort to support the oldest possible Rust version? Because from an operating system packaging standpoint, mm -hmm. to like package the stuff, if it ever reaches a point where the, the Rust version required exceeds what OS has, it, it, be it just becomes a big problem mm -hmm. to try to package it in the OS. And when you take something that has a 10-year life cycle, uh, you know, like the, the Red Hat ecosystem, you know, then, you're, then you have a big problem. Mm -hmm. um, and with Rust especially, and Golang, and, and these new languages that have you know, these tiny modules for every stupid little thing, uh, it, it gets really aggravating. Yeah. Um, we, we do try to support uh, at least two uh, less uh, versions, but I, I get I take your your note and we will definitely consider it, when, especially with Rust and other languages as well. Cool. Yeah, it's a really interesting idea, and I can see how it becomes part very quickly. Yeah. <laughs> But, and that's before you even get to higher level libraries and do something very specific, like, hey, here's a library to use Redis to job queue. And, and it wraps whatever yeah. data structures yeah. they're using. Or here's a library to use Redis for rate limiting. And it wraps a bunch of things so you don't have to think about it. Or here's a library that can use memcache or Redis for caching. And it'll dynamically, they'll switch between those based on your configuration. Actually, this abstraction on top of abstraction. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's true, but this architecture actually does uh, bring you an opportunity to change the the database, right? You can use, as we talked about, that we have the glide, um, we have the call layer, yeah. which has can replace the end user, end client that she is using, that it is using yeah. to get to the databases. So. Maybe get, getting to memcached is an option later on. Uh, it's just something maybe on on later roadmap, <laughs> but not uh, currently. Yeah. Yeah, but it would have to be purpose specific. Like, how would you use memcached for a job queue? Like, I can see a caching yeah, library it, that it, it, it uses Redis or Valkyrie or memcached because you have a very specific pattern. But then, well, then I guess you have a job queue that uses either you know say. SQS or Redis, so as a, it's a more purpose-specific abstraction versus... Yeah, yeah, I agree, I agree. How does the software even work at the end of the day? You guys ever wonder that? Right? <laughs> 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 thanks, thanks, everyone. Thank you.